I was really happy, comfortable. I had all the flexibility in the world that I wanted. But then I met Declan, and that was it. Before Taryn Burtz became head of partner success at X Recruiter, she thrived as general manager at Randstad. Tune into the podcast today and hear about Taryn's journey and why she took the leap from a comfortable role to where she is now. Welcome back to another episode of Confessions of a Recruiter, and we've got possibly one of the most special episodes today because we have yours truly Taryn Boats on the pod thank you for coming on Taryn you're welcome now let me give people a little bit of context on who you are so then that way when we're talking they'll be able to connect the dots a little bit so Taryn you're head of partner success at X Recruiter it was a new acquisition by X Recruiter a very a very uh grateful acquisition for you to come and join the dark side <laughs> But before that, you were a general manager at Randstad Digital Australia for six, well, you were there for six, seven years, basically. Uh, before that, you had your own recruitment agency for six and a half years, 101 Careers. And then before that, you did a, a variety of different recruitment roles, totaling 18 years of recruitment experience. Yeah. So you are an OG <laughs> recruitment god. Oh, wouldn't call it a recruitment. That's very average. A lifer. Yes. A, lifer. <laughs> a lifer. Yeah. A stuck, lifer. Stuck in recruitment for the rest of my life. Yes. <laughs> I love that. So you <laughs> you definitely have uh, a lot of stories that you could probably share, a lot of knowledge that you can share. You've been in internal talent acquisition. You've run your own agency. Now you're working at X Recruiter. So you're seeing all different facets on you know the recruitment industry as a whole. So your kind of holistic experience should be extremely valuable in this conversation. Uh, but firstly, I just want to start by asking you, what is head of partner success at X Recruiter? That's a funny question that I've been asked a number of times in the last couple of weeks, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around exactly how to tell that story. Um, but I'm pretty much going on the fact that it's around people who want to start their, no their own agencies. We will onboard them, give them all the tools that they need, teach them how to use them make sure that they understand what their business is, how it's going to work, what their plans are, and then make sure that they're successful as quickly as possible and then stay successful. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I've learned in the last couple of weeks is that when people join up, they actually don't know what to do to start their own business. So you almost get to those first few days of, great, I'm um, live. What do, what do I do? What does day one look like? What does my diary look like? How do I structure? Do I phone a client? Do I start sourcing? You know? And that can paralyze a lot of people. So I think the biggest benefit that I've seen so far is the fact that we give them that and then they, they go, okay, cool. This is what my first six weeks looks like. This is what my first month is going to be busy doing. Um, and that's then one thing you, when you're out on your own, when I started, I didn't, I, I was nervous to even take a lunch break. I was like, do I take a lunch break? You took lunch breaks? I, yeah. <laughs> 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 but, um, but yeah, that like you, you have no direction, yeah, and you don't have anyone telling you, "Hey, you need to start doing X, Y, Z." Yeah, you need to start calling. You need to do this. Need to do that. So, yeah, for it's, sure. um, but and it changes as well. So the first couple of weeks when you're running your own business, you kind of like head down, bum up, just getting shit done, and obviously we tell them what that means in the first few days. But then it changes. So like three, six months, or some people three, four months, and then some people six, seven months, and your day structure changes. You're not doing the same things because all of a sudden you might have contractors that you now need to look after. So it's not just pure BD anymore, just pure candidate interviews. It, it shifts. And then having a chat with one of the partners just this morning, she's probably, well, what month are we? She's like 10, 10 months in and she's going, oh, well, I'm not feeling the joy of the placement anymore. I, d I don't understand what's changed. And she's now at a different stage where she needs to understand what her overall strategy is and what her goals are so that she can bring that back to going, oh, this is why I'm doing it and this is where I'm going to find the joy in my role because it changes as you evolve. I love that. So so in short, it's kind of like having a, a personal mentor or advisor in your business that you can bounce ideas off, you can – um, get clarity when you when you're unsure of which direction to go. This is probably a massive, massive intangible or tangible value add that <clears throat> probably you don't realize how good it is until you are in business. Um, and so I know when I first started Vendito, I um, I thankfully and gratefully had a lot of support from my mum. But ultimately, if I had someone that understood recruitment, 
my ability to scale and get to where I needed to be quicker would have been sped up by 5, 10, 15x. And so that's why I'm really excited about your role because not only is it super impactful uh, for our partners um, day to day, but it gives a lot of recruiters that safety blanket and security and stability to go, I don't need to feel like I need to know everything to make a decision. I can lean into the support of ex-recruiter and get them to kind of help me out and have a chat to Taryn and go, hey, I'm in this situation. Taryn's run an agency for six years before she knows she's been in this situation. And so they have a much higher level degree of uh, knowledge that we can pass down to them, which is really, really exciting. So um, how are you how are you finding the first couple of months? Couple of months or weeks? Six weeks. Four to six weeks, yeah. I think five and a half. Keep talking baby Jeez, it feels longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that as a positive. <laughs> well, you've just settled in so well. It's oh. like you're so naturally here. You know, you're a yeah. part of the team. You're adding value to all the partners. A lot of the partners absolutely love you. So it feels longer than five or six weeks. But how is your first five or six weeks? Yeah, really, really good. Um, coming into the office every possible day that I can. I think the first time I worked from home, I almost felt a little bit too disconnected and I'm a person that likes to be in the office anyway. So coming in every day really works for me. Um, I found the team insanely just incredible. So every single touch point that I've like dealt with so far, everybody's so passionate about the whole journey and the experience and every partner having the right kind of hype and the right kind of service um, and just being excellent in everything that they do. It's just... It's so refreshing because you see a lot of people that go to work at the moment, and we're obviously having a productivity challenge across probably the world and Australia, but people who are coming to work here have never seen such a productive environment from go to end. It's just everything is just go, 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 and people just get it done, and it's because they want to. Mm. It's just really, really refreshing. So I've had more energy in the last couple of weeks than I've had in a long while. I'm bouncing out of bed in the morning, um, if I'm getting home shattered, it's a good kind of shattered. Um, I'm back at the gym, and nice. every time I see friends and you know colleagues or old colleagues, they're just saying, "T, you're glowing. You just you know your passion and your sparkles back." And that comes from the energy of the team here, and I think the fact that everybody that is working here is doing it for a really good reason. Yeah, everyone's on the mission. Yeah, everyone's on the mission. You know, there's a lot of impact. Uh, super, super fun. Yeah, I mean, I could talk till I'm blue in the face about X Recruiter. Um, but so um, that's been an interesting shift. How did you square up in your mind going from Randstad as a GM, very stable, very secure? From what I heard, and if any of Taryn's old ex-colleagues are listening to this, which I guarantee there's <laughs> going to be a fair few of them, I'd love to know some some uh, some spicy or interesting things about Taryn if if you are listening that, you know, put him in a LinkedIn post or make a post about it, it'd be really interesting to there learn. There would be nothing. <laughs> are you sure? Mm. I feel like there'd be some. There would be no- nothing here <laughs> around <laughs> colleagues, nothing that they would put out there. So h- how did you how did you first go from such a stable, secure, um, like a high-performing role? Because I've, I've heard from Randstad people like, oh, Taryn's – taken the digital team from this to that and you know she's done this and she's amazing and i've heard nothing but glowing feedback um so why would you remove yourself out of an environment where it is seems comfortable stable secure into uh a a newer environment what like what made that change that's a fantastic question and if you go back on declan's linkedin you'll see that i was very resistant initially to did declan slide in the dms he did oh Ooh, yeah, you're good did. at that, mate. Yeah, so <laughs> slide in, <laughs> slid in there. Yeah, yeah. slide in deep for DMs. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then had um, Liesl help me with the clothes. Yeah. Went to the... Um, oh, really? Yeah. yeah what you went that to the South African Common network. ground with the South African yeah. network. Mm-hmm. And then oh. Liesl was like, I'll help you get it done. Yeah, and she did. And we got a coffee. Yeah, we got a coffee. And I think that coffee is probably going to be one of the days that shifted the rest of my life because I would not have... I would not have actively been looking. I was really happy and incredibly comfortable. And I think that that's one of the key points is that, yeah, comfortable. I had all the flexibility in the world that I wanted. I ran the business as much as reasonably possible as if it was my own. 
and I uh, loved the fact that I could make a number of decisions and um, have that autonomy. It's always been really important to me. Um, but super, super comfortable. Just loving. Were you over the com- – Did you, you know you were comfortable? Or yeah. was oh, it until we caught up? I knew I was comfortable. Yeah. In fact, one of my amazing colleagues, Shona, had interviewed a lady who is a um, – she, she sits on a couple of boards and she's like a CIO at a few places – um, in the past, and she was saying that she moves jobs every two years or so, and she does that because you can only learn so much in the place that you're at, and she's just really accelerated her career, and I remember a show coming back after that meeting and saying, this woman's phenomenal, and there was like this little inch of jealousy because I was going, oh, I feel like I used to be like that, and I'm just really comfortable now, but when you've got three kids, and the, the golden retriever who we love, and you know, husband and life, you just kind of yeah, comfortable can be really, really good. Um, but then I met Declan, and there was an air about him, which there is. Anybody who meets him would know it. And he's oh, thanks, T. Yeah, you're welcome. Very charismatic, <laughs> um, and very vulnerable and honest. And we had a really transparent conversation, and it was very positive. But I could see the passion and the excitement for what he does, and I kind of missed that a little bit. And when I went home that night and I started looking up what X Recruiter does, because I had ignored you guys completely prior, despite what people would have said. Um, <laughs> and I was going, oh my God, this is really, this is really good. Like really, really good. And then I dove a little bit deeper and I was like, shit, this is really, really <laughs> good. And then I came through and met with you guys. And that was it. Like, I know I was really nervous when I met with you, but I don't think those nerves kind of dropped off. And it was more excitement than anything else. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. Because so we offered you, you rejected us. I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I loved, I still do, I love my boss, my old boss, and um, my team so much. And I felt like it was almost abandoning all of them mm. to, to do this. And I remember Leon and I going for dinner and me saying, this is so selfish that I want to do this, but I, I can't, it's like, and I think I sent you the meme. I don't think it was good timing. But about, you know, the recruiter <laughs> wa- walking, <laughs> holding hands with somebody and looking back at the person. But that was ex-recruiter. Yeah. I just couldn't get it out of my head. I was just so excited. And I took a week off. And I spent the week listening to the podcasts and looking into all the different agencies that you work with. And I just, I couldn't stop. It was, I was sucked in. And, and then I came back and I was like, will you? Texting each other. <laughs> yeah, when, you, when you have me. Are you back. sure you've made the right decision? Yeah. <laughs> that was the text that I think yeah. opened up the conversation again. Yeah. But oh. we're incredibly grateful you decided to do what was best for you and yeah, come I'm on board. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So talk to us about your time at Randstad because Randstad is a big beast. Um, there's a lot of moving parts at Randstad. A lot of people can get kind of lost in Randstad too because it's so big. Talk to us about how you grew your career inside Randstad. For anyone that said, hey, is a Randstad or just a big agency on maybe if they're wanting to follow the same footpath as you and go from where you started to where you ended. Like, was there a strategy behind growing your ke- your career through Randstad or was it opportunistic or like walk us through that seven year journey? Yeah, I think probably, I don't think I was actively thinking about what I was doing. Initially, I came over and um, I'd moved from South Africa and it was... I'm moving, I'm creating a better life for myself, my husband, my kids, um, and that was all that mattered. So when I arrived at Randstad, and it was a very interesting place, to be fair, when I arrived, um, in in terms of the team, the little tech team that we had, they didn't have much of a brand out there. They didn't have, you know, like a number of clients coming to us for tech roles. They had kind of dealt with um, a few government agencies um, and GCOs and then maybe some commercial, but not much at all. Um, and I remember going home again. Leon's very good at grounding me and, you know, being a sounding board. And I went home, I was like, whatever, I, I don't know what I've done. Like, I don't know what PAYG is, and <laughs> I don't know how to run a contractor, and just had to wrap my head around so many different things. And he said, but this is where you thrive. This is what you're good at. Like, just make it your own and smash it, you know? And I think once I remembered, and it's something that we t- used to talk about, like, you just straighten your crown because you're a queen, and you take control, and you make it your own. And that's just ultimately what we did. So there were definitely ups and downs, and I can see how people can get lost in that bigger agency mentality. But I just went, okay, well, I've done I've done my own thing before. If this was my own business, if this was my own money, if these were my staff that I had employed, and I was paying their salary out of my pocket, and... Um, 
you know, I needed to get, uh, I wanted to get them successful. So if I needed them to be as successful as they can be, what would I do? Mm. So just constantly putting that hat on. Um, it got me in trouble a few times. I definitely got a few um, what happened? slaps in the wrist. Well, because when you when you work for yourself, you can go outside of certain boundaries quite easily. And there are no boundaries. There are no boundaries. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. can do what you want. So if a, <laughs> yeah. if a dental practitioner called you and wanted a receptionist and you you know were low on IT jobs, you would work the receptionist role or whatever. Mm. So when we had digital marketing roles come in that were kind of like a web designer, we would sometimes, like my mindset initially was, yeah, well, we, Get it we, done. we fill it, right? Because yeah. you've got to fill it. And then I very quickly learned that, no, there's a team that does that and you have to give that team that job and this job comes to this team. So those little things were definitely mm. um, often raised. So what was what did Randstad specialise in before tech? Because they've made a few acquisitions in the last five years with yeah. like Oric, Phoenixl, um, Finite. So what, what industries were they specialising in when you started? A lot. So they had everything except tech. No, they did have tech. So they had four people in the team. I think it was four when I joined. Mm -hmm. um, so they did already have a little tech team, but they just weren't, yeah, it was a million dollar business at that stage, yeah. Wow, interesting. Yeah. And then <clears throat> what was your next move? Because you're building a team from scratch, an agency from scratch, a division essentially from scratch. It's yeah. got a million dollar runway with four consultants. Yeah. So just by sheer numbers, they're not exactly the most high performing team. Yeah. What was your, what was your next move? Um, I was very fortunate that the team leader before me had hired somebody from another team and she was what they would call a pocket rocket. So she just got in there and she kind of came in as I was coming in. So it was really good timing. I had the opportunity to mold her, which is probably where I do best is when I had newer consultants and I could shift them how I needed them to work. So I could mold her. Then I had Maddie in the team who just was able to teach me everything that was Randstad. Um, and those two and me, I think we just started to really just dig down and make it happen from there. So having them absolutely kill it, me, I was killing it as well. We were having the time of our lives and we had Ram there as well. who had some really good commercial um, yep. experience too. So we just all kind of came together and I think I might have blinked and we had six or seven in my specific team because I was a team lead and then we had different teams as well. And slowly but surely that amalgamated and then I applied for the kind of state manager role um, and got that one and then blinked again and we had 17 consultants. Wow. Um, yeah. That's pretty solid growth. Over how many years? Six, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we And we went from a mill to, I want to say, just over six. Yeah, six more. Okay, so you 6 x the business mm -hmm. inside a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so where did the... Uh, where did the majority of those billings come from? Was it just contracting or was it a perm or like what was the split between Depend the perm, the contracting? Yeah, it depended on the year. And I think this is one of those things where running your own business is so different because we had so much perm business that we had acquired at one stage because a lot of the consultants were a lot more commercial, which I loved. And we would actually go out and do sales because a lot of the business can often just come to you. Yeah. Um. So we would go get it and we, we built up some really good perm pipeline. And there's a... There's a time that you've got to focus on building a contractor book for stability and for forecasting and for um, value, I suppose, and you know all of those kinds of things. Yeah. But there's also a time that you want to boost the business with that perm, and it's a great space to be. So one of the struggles that I would have sometimes is where do you focus if you've got so much contingent work coming through and you know so much contract work versus the perm? And that was something that I really, really struggled with. And I think in hindsight, we probably should have smashed that perm that we had then a little bit harder because we probably focused on growing the contract growth a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. But it was a it would shift. It would be between sixty to eighty percent contracting. Oh okay. So a fair bit of contracting. A lot of contracting. And yeah. that was because that's where you've got your stability. What yeah. made you want to do the perm or reflecting? Oh I think perm's fun. I come from perm. Yep. Um so the fun and then it's good money. Mm. Yeah. Interesting it's it's easy to like, and that's why a lot of recruiters that go out on their own, they're contract recruiters and then they're having to learn perm. Yeah. And then you get stuck in the vortex and used to these 15, 20, 30, 40 K deals. Yeah. Instant cash injection. But then, you know, it's not, it's obviously not as stable. Yeah, for sure. As building a contract desk. Okay. So if there are any recruiters out there that are interested to find out what it's like to have a VA support them in their role, whether that be to bill more 
uh, reduce tasks that they don't enjoy doing or be a more effective recruiter in their niche, then we definitely recommend reaching out to the outsource people or top. Reach out to them, inquire on how they can implement a VA in your agency and to support you. And if you mention ex-recruiter or confessions of a recruiter, they will give you a 13% discount off your bill per month on this VA that will allow you to scale your business, scale your desk, and to bill more and make more money. So go reach out to the outsource people, say Confession sent you, get your discount and see what is possible. How does recruitment differ between here and South Africa or is it the exact same? Um, no, not the exact same at all. It's predominantly perm in South Africa. You wouldn't touch government recruitment with a 10-foot pole because it's incredibly corrupt. So very, very, very different. And I think what I love about South Africa is that you've got to be incredibly entrepreneurial. And if you are, you will do so well. So you've almost got people who are doing really, really, really well. Just the so sheer economic gap yep. is massive, yeah. yeah. So you've got these people who are doing really, really, really well. And the lifestyle then is so easy. So us moving here, we all of a sudden had a house that was a quarter of the size, no pool. Um, you know, we were living a very comfortable life over there. Um but that comes from massive amounts of perm that just keeps rolling. Yeah. So there's a massive employment market in South well, Africa. You've got like, I actually haven't looked at the stats in a long time, but 40% unemployment rate. 40% so unemployment. How do you make yeah. placements? How do you make like placements that? then? Well, because the 60% that are employed are generally pretty good. Ah. And they've got, they've got incredibly skilled people there, um, which is fantastic. We've got a lot of them leaving the country. Um, but I yeah, feel like there's been farming. like South. South Af South Africans <laughs> have been leaving the country for the last ten years. Mm. I feel like it's just been Even an exodus for ages. Yes, going nah, no, this is this place is no good. We've got to go. Yeah, there's fifty six million people there though. There's a few. Yeah, <laughs> we've got a Twice few. Twice the size of Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So so because there's so much unemployment, the actual employable candidates are so few and far between. That's why companies would pay – like, what are the fees like in South Africa? Are they oh, the same? 15%, yeah, you'd be seeing the same. But the salaries okay. are a lot lower, but then it kind of just all works out, though. But cost of living is way lower. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah, gotcha. Mm. And so you, you ran your own business for six years. Yeah. So I, I, I noticed that you went from internal recruitment to starting your own agency. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting shift because we often have internal recruiters – come to ex-recruiter and say, I want to do this. Yeah. And generally our feedback is you don't know what you're getting into. Yeah. It's a hardcore dog eat dog sales role that you're, you're, you're trying to get into. Maybe you should go start at a recruitment agency first, see if you like working for agency and then start your business. Yeah. Um, obviously you didn't get Sound that advice. Challenge, <laughs> challenge that status quo. Yeah. Well, I think so. What was Blake the, holding you back? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What was the like? What was that transition like? Going from internal recruitment to just starting your own agency. What were the biggest challenges you found? I think um, if you take a step back, I was with an agency first. Oh. And going into an agency at 19, 20 years old was very interesting. I was one of the youngest there, um, and things like what you just said kind of a lot of fire inside of me when you go oh you probably would do this rather than what you want to do I kind of go well fuck you I'm going to do what I want to do <laughs> yeah um so working in an agency I was headhunted by my favorite clients they were a financial services provider they had a head office of around 200 people and they wanted somebody internal to do all their tech recruitment and then pick up wherever else they needed to so I had the time of my life moving from a very um how would I describe it like a fast-paced agency that you if you had a zero you were done you were out um going into and I loved that by the way I thrive in that kind of environment then moved to the internal role and absolutely loved that I'd sit with the RT team we would do scrums in the morning um I got to know them all personally and work-wise and I learned so much about the tech sitting with them as well so I absolutely loved that and I had a COO there who really pushed me Probably a little bit too much, but really, really pushed me and made sure that I grew while I was there as well. Um, so when we were all made redundant eventually from from that, as I suppose internal recruiters often are, um, I went and interviewed at a couple of different agencies and I hated every single one of them. I just thought, oh, this is not fun. This is not cool. Don't love this. Don't love that for whatever reason. And I initially joined a friend who had her own agency doing finance and auditing types of recruitment with her and 
my love is definitely more tech recruitment. So figured I would kind of start that arm. And then when I was speaking to friends, they just said, why would you do that with her? Why wouldn't you just do it on your own? I'm like, Does that make sense? So completely just went on my own, got a friend to design. I love your story because it reminds me of mine, but got a friend to design a logo overnight based on the fact that I wanted to build a house and a development across the road that was called 101. You became 101 Careers overnight. I loved pink. Pink was in the logo and we were trading the next day. Um, and then within about a month, I'd hired somebody to come and join me who was on maternity leave. She was staying in her mum's spare room with this new baby and was kind of working for not nearly enough money. And I just went, oh, she's she's pretty driven. I reckon if she listens to the way I can coach her, she will, she'll kill it. And my God, did she kill it. Epic. I think I know who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, you would know who I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's a machine. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Okay. So in your first month, you decided to hire somebody. Yeah. And <clears throat> what were the biggest challenges that you found starting your business? Because um, everyone has a different um, challenge, whether it be focusing on the right things, whether it be BD, whether it be um, prioritizing. Like what, what are the biggest challenges you found when you started your own agency? I think the first one was buying my own laptop um, with no capital. Well, I didn't really have much capital after being made redundant. So my dad bought me a laptop, um, but I paid him back in the same month, which I was very proud of. Um, the challenges were things like, where do I get the money if I need to do anything? Or how do I um, sign up for a, the equivalent of Seek for a 12-month subscription? And I don't know if I'm going to make it. So you start off by going, okay, well, I've got very limited means, and I did. So my scaling up would have been a lot slower than a lot of people would have here because I only had capacity to, well, I only had like the ability to be able to use some systems, like the free ones, which you're just not going to get the great candidates on. Um, so it was like struggle street every single day until we got to a point where we were making enough money that we could go, okay, well, we're starting to get some clients on board now. We can commit to a subscription or... Um, you know, we could do LinkedIn if we wanted to or whatever it was that we needed to, to do. Everything was just, I think, a struggle initially, mm. which is good. Mm. Yeah. The, the scrappy days. The sc they are scrappy yeah. days, yeah. That reminds me of my start. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> and what were you just making a list from the equivalent of Yellow Pages, Google, like, and just start cold calling companies? The good thing was that I'd worked in an agency a couple of years back. So I Had knew some relationships. Yeah. And not even relationships, but I just knew who the big hires were. So Derivco was one of the companies that I recruited for in South Africa and they became probably our biggest client before I before I left. And I had worked with them very little at the agency that I worked at before. But that was because my manager wouldn't let me do certain things the way that I wanted to do them. So it was an opportunity to pick up that um that phone and go, Hey, I've gone on my own I'd love to work with you and don't worry about those things that I couldn't agree to at some stage because I'll make them work now. Yeah. Why not? You know, that didn't make sense why we wouldn't commit to whatever whatever it was at that stage. Um, so it was I was able to do that. And then the company that made me redundant needed staff and who better than somebody who worked there internally for three years. So invoicing them my salary one month for one deal was very epic. Very and that's so so interesting that you bring that up because it's it's something that I I run into this conversation a lot with recruiters where they are wedded to the agency that they work at and the brand and they feel like the brand is what creates their success. And it's not until they bite the bullet and, and venture out with the, the new brand of wh whoever they are yeah. and they end up acquiring bigger and better clients that they did at their previous agency because whatever relationship was ruined from the previous consultant was that was there or the manager said no to something and they never got a replacement or, or whatever the circumstances and it's it's funny that there's a, a common theme along a lot of recruiters where when they've worked at a, a bigger agency they think their brand is you know what drives their success they start on their own and then they're way more successful with better clients and yeah. it's like it's like the polar opposite of what you think yeah I don't think it is the brand. I think it is the person at the end of the day. And people buy from people. So, yeah, they're definitely getting the work because of who they are. The brand's only going to bring you so much, but the brand's also going to hold you back because there might have been a consultant in a different team who burned somebody at some stage. And, mm. yeah, that's always going to happen. Mm. So you had six years yep. running your own agency. Mm -hmm. Tell us about some of the highs. What are the things that you're grateful for that you're like, geez, that was a good moment? 
dancing on tables and we used to just have the best time. So I remember going to see our accountants and that was one of the things. So we would build up and then all of a sudden, we, shit, we need to pay tax or something. I don't know, like, you know, and you learn as you go. Yeah. So all of a sudden we, you know, we had an accounting firm that was helping us out. And I remember going there and them going, you need to spend some money. You, you Like, it's all just sitting here and the tax is going to really hit you. Is this, am I okay to talk about that? Absolutely. Yeah, okay, yeah, cool. yeah. I hate tax. And then um, me being like, cool, what kind of, what kind of money would I spend? What would I do? Oh, well, entertainment's the easiest one to hit. And fun. So all <laughs> of a sudden we were setting incentives and we were having the best time. So we would go to a beautiful restaurant called the Oyster Box um, and have ridiculous cocktails and just have the best time and like take clients out and just, I think, those little moments where we would actually just bond and enjoy the f- the fruit of our success was probably the biggest that's what makes running a small agency so So enjoyful yeah Yeah. and then just the best everyone's winning together you actually have personal relationships with everyone and cash flow is crazy to the point where you're getting your account and say go spend more money because you've got too much of it yeah uh like that is a really you know that's a really interesting dynamic for someone that's never been in that position before where they're like hang on you want me to spend yeah more money like Yeah. yeah absolutely we're gonna reduce your tax bills you just go out and buy yourself a car buy yourself a washing machine or whatever it ends up being just to reduce your tax and then definitely seeing so we had there were three of us that build really 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 well um so seeing like b burnett who worked with me there and then came over to australia with me seeing her renovate her house cash was just out of this world like watching her go from mum's spare room to her own place um and just seeing her elevate and get a brand new car like which she never thought she'd buy a brand new car at the box you know like little things like that were absolute highlights you kind of know you're on the right track yeah that's what gets me so passionate one about recruitment and being able to help a consultant do that but now it's like a whole Mm. new dimension helping a business owner become successful themselves yeah new level (coughs) yeah it's wild yeah yeah i think once you get past the uh, once you you get into starting an agency you're doing it for the money usually because you want to make more money and maybe live how you want to live but then once you've got the money that you've desired it, it the, the shift goes away from the money and then the fulfillment comes from watching others around you get lifted up yeah. by the same success. Um, that's that's a super interesting um, shift and it kind of ties back to uh, what you said earlier around uh, when someone comes into X Recruiter, they need something different in their first three months than they need in 12 months. Yeah. And it's this forever growing and evolving and changing landscape where um, <coughs> if you think too fixed – um, you'll you'll just pull up stumps really really fast, yeah. and so yeah, that's probably I think one of the most fulfilling parts about being in our position is watching people's light bulb go off and go oh wow this is this is the new me this is the next challenge this is this is what I'm going to do now so um, yeah super super rewarding. Would you guys have like when you were running your own agencies gotten to a point where you went okay well I'm not used to earning this amount of money um, I don't really know what to do next. Uh, or I need some guidance in terms of w- how I change what I'm doing or how I grow to the next level, would you guys have gone and s- like looked for feedback from a coach or a mentor or somebody? Like I generally had a life coach most of my life. Did you not have? Nothing formal. No. Uh, and, and, <coughs> and maybe at, at the time, like I had a, this old guy helping me out at the, at the time, giving me advice and stuff. And he's like, you know, business coaches are bad, this, that and the other. So I just didn't trust anyone. And maybe it was, I don't know, his limiting belief for me to stay talking to him that he's made me scared of everyone else. Yeah. And maybe I didn't believe that people could help. Yeah. And it wasn't until Blake's like, you know, Blake's motto is don't recreate it. Just find out what they do well and repeat it. (laughs) And that's the quickest (laughs) part to success. So like taking that on three years ago, (coughs) now you get coaches for everything. You're like, oh, this is so much easier. Yeah. But nah, I probably had a massive ego when it came to that department of getting help yeah and it's probably the worst thing i ever did mm. yeah i i've always been quite open-minded to learning things from other people um sometimes it's worked exceptionally well for me other times not yeah. um so you know i i sometimes reflect and and um i, I get a bit gung-ho with advice investments spending money doing whatever and I generally, my my kind of rule of thumb is 70% of whatever I invest in, whether it be coaches, 
property, crypto, people, 70% of every dollar that you put in is going to be wasted. Okay. 30% will come off, but it'll be amazing when that comes off. And yep. so at least that way when, I don't know, you invest in a coach and it's $20,000 and uh, maybe it's not living up to what you thought it was, but that 30% of value that you got out of them, you could actually multiply that by 10 or 20x yep. and really run with it. So that's kind of like what I've always thought of is for every dollar I spend, be okay to waste 70% of it and to just make sure that at least 30% of it you're getting value and it's worked out all right. For also you the a thing with coaches is though, you can only get the answers to the questions you ask. So it like forces you to get better at asking questions. Like yeah. I think when I had my first coach in sales or whatever, I, I didn't know what questions to ask. So you don't know what you don't know. And then you learn from that. And then now you get a better coach and you're like, oh, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Being able to get more yeah. value. Because I think some people sit there and go, like even with a PT, it's like, oh, well just, yeah, tell me what to do. And But they don't, they forget that execution part or. Yeah. Because that, that's what I think I like the most about, I mean, the model is incredible, obviously, with Extracrude and all the tools that you get and everything that you get taught. But the fact that you've got that person, and that comes in so many different options. So there's Matt, there's myself, there's you two. Um, you know, if you need some branding help, chat to Serge or whatever it might be. There's so many different people who are at your beck and call, within reason. Um, but to be able to say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. Can you Can you help me? Because... I was always paying for some kind of life coach, um, mentor, psychologist, counsellor, whatever it might be, so that I could make sure that I was on track um, and still growing. I was always very focused on making sure that there was continuous improvement in my life in some area or way or form. And you've got that right yet, which is phenomenal. 100%. I always, I always think that the people that fail don't fail because they can't do it. They just don't know how to do it. Yeah. And so if they just had someone there to show them how to do it, they would be able to get it done. <laughs> and that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest gap for a lot of people that start an agency. It's like all of them are probably able to do it if someone shows them when the moments they need it and they go, I'm in this position right now. I don't know how to get out of it. They speak to someone and then boom, it's so easy. They're like, oh, that makes so much sense. Cool. I'm off and running. Yeah. Whereas if you don't have that support around you, kind of like deck, it's like, um, oh, you just keep doing this, keep doing this, and you're just banging your head up against the wall, getting nowhere. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you have this like abundance mindset and you start talking to other people and then you're like, you start accelerating so much faster. Yeah. So it's just, it's not that people can't do it. It's they just don't know how. Exactly right. Yeah. What have been the most, because you've spoken to our first ever partner, yeah. our second ever partner, and you've onboarded, um, what, four or five new partners yeah. since you've started. What What are the main is there anything common or is there different questions that like, what do people come into you with and they're like, oh, boom, that's the, the light bulb moment. Like, Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing that I've seen so far was probably with the AMP boys and probably one of the most wholesome sessions so far. Um, they reached out to ask if I could help with consistency um, and just sitting down with them and asking them a range of different questions very openly and honestly and they were great so they were just putting everything on the table in terms of how they're structuring their day at the moment what is working what's not working what hours they're working what they're getting done what outcomes they're trying to achieve and by asking them a range of different questions realizing that they had set themselves up to do the build of that business and they had done that so well like really really well but then they'd gotten to that kind of I want to call it a plateau moment where they um, they didn't know how to shift their day to day to be able to accommodate what they're doing now and and how different business is now, um, and they had said that it was a bit of a light bulb moment, so that's why I reference this one. But just seeing them kind of click of oh that's that's not how I need to run my day anymore, you know, and putting their business owner hat on rather than their friend hat on when they're having their morning meeting. Um, and to actually implement a morning meeting with an agenda and to do an end of day wrap up um, with each other because those little rituals make a big difference, mm -hmm. but you might not need them initially, you know. So I think it is just that getting to a different stage of business and realizing, hold on, something's not working here. I don't actually know what it is, but let me have a chat with somebody who might be able to go. And it was they had all the answers. I just had to ask them a couple of questions mm. and they came to it. But just having that sounding board to be able to say, this is what it's happening. This is where I'm not getting my outcomes. What can I, small little tweak, what's going to, it better have changed. I'm going to check with them. But yeah, I sure believe they, they, they execute everything. They're fantastic. <coughs>
But I, I think that's one of the biggest things that like the commercial or business acumen, and it's no one's fault, but like you're not taught that in a recruitment agency. Yeah, no. And that's the biggest thing you learn when starting your own agency, especially having and someone that can remind you along the way. Like I remember when those boys kicked off, everyone's their best friend. How do we do BD? We book a beer with them. <laughs> and now they're chatting about <coughs> projects, ROI, what's the loss of investment, yeah. and actually having valuable commercial conversations with clients. And they're like – Mate, I'm sitting in, they're asking me for advice. I'm sitting on, on interviews. They're, you know, wanting our feedback. Like six months ago, mate, we were these two 27, 28 year olds and yeah. we just thought everyone was our best friend. And it's like, but being able to remind them that, hey guys, you were here, now you're here. Yeah. Because they don't see the change because they're just day to day. Yeah. But I think that's one of the biggest impacts that recruiters get to benefit from. And because it's not very often that you reflect because you're just doing. Yeah, they don't, especially in the first couple of months. Yeah, people are not taking the time to reflect. So how many of the partners have you spoken to now? Um, Percentage-wise or actual numbers? Looking at actual numbers? Is there many you haven't? 40? Well, Tyson finally answered my call. Oh. <laughs> so most of if them. If he's listening, Tyson, stop Tyson. dodging the calls, no, big fella. he took them. He, <laughs> he was booked in the meeting. Um, I think I've probably spoken to the majority. every single live one. Yeah. yeah. I, is there any... Is there any common theme amongst all the partners? Like, what are the traits? Like, if someone's sitting here listening to this and they're, you know, maybe they're thinking about it, maybe they don't think they're, the, you know, it's something that they want to do. They're not, you know, they don't have the, the pedigree to, to start their agency. But listening to you and, and understanding, you know, what the common traits are amongst all these people, if they could relate to that, what do you think those traits would be? Um, that's a great question. I would probably say... I might flip it on its head a little bit and say that what I do see is that everyone's scared. They've all got fear. They, Everybody's worried that they're not going to be good enough, that they're going to fail. Um, at some stage, everybody battles with consistency. So whether they have an incredible start and then drop off or don't have a great start and then only pick up later, whatever that might be, consistency comes up at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so you can definitely see those little themes coming through. I think the ones that do well, really, really well, have a really good amount of grit and passion and I don't know. I think the grit I like is that. a big thing. I, I like calling out that everyone has a bit of fear. Yeah. Everyone has a bit of an oh shit moment. Yeah. Who do we speak to? Yeah, we were speaking to the Empowered Boys up in Townsville and they were off to a flyer. Yeah. Um, they've done a really great first quarter in business, um, better than most. And... I said to uh, you and I said to him, I was like, mate, did we, uh, were you always this confident? How did it go? And he goes, mate, to be honest, the first 10, 11, 12 days, I was like, what the fuck have I done? <laughs> yeah. Bambi legs. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And I was thinking, oh my God, have I just made the biggest blunder here? Yeah. I've just left a great job at Hayes, earning great money. And, um, and yeah, for the first, like, he's like, mate, for the first week and a half, I thought... I've really put myself in a bit of a mischief here. And then it just flew after that. Because I think his first deal, he was chasing a 4K flat for an admin role. And he's like, I called like 70 people for this 4K <laughs> deal and I still couldn't get it done. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm nowhere. What have I, <laughs> why have I done this? And then the next deal comes in and it was all good. And, you know, then they're off to a flying start. But it's, it's funny that every single person that starts an agency, no matter how much support you've got, you always have the oh shit moment. Yep. And it doesn't matter what you build. No. Yeah. No. No, it doesn't matter. We have million dollar billers that are still having oh shit moments. Yeah. That are still not sure if they're going to make it work. Yeah. And it's like, mate, you, you bring in 100, 200K a month, you will be fine. Yeah. You just need to do half of that in one month and you're, go you're done for the whole year. And they're like, yeah, you're right. And it's like, just do it again. Yeah. And like, oh, I don't know. Hopefully I've got it in me. It's like, mate, you've got it in you. So everyone has this. This moment of insecurity. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, that was good. Good to flip that on its head. And if I was listening to, because I figured I'm coming on this podcast so incredibly well prepared, and um, <laughs> you know, obviously knew it was happening for weeks before, <laughs> which is a lie. Um, so I was listening to a summary of one of my favorite books this morning called Grit, which is probably why it's also top of mind. And um, in in there she talks about the fact that the people that do incredibly well and are very successful at whatever it is that they're doing, whether it's a sport or a business or life, 
are the ones that always feel like they haven't done enough, that they need to do that a little bit more. And you can see it with the likes of a Theo who will give us a call and let me know how, I mean, he's doing. He's I had a text at 5.30, this 5.28. Mate, got an idea, need to talk, hit me when you can. <laughs> Why is he not texting me at 5.38? <laughs> <laughs> uh. But, I mean, he's killing it. And then the minute I go, oh my gosh, well done. Oh, not enough. Yeah, uh, yeah I know, but well done. Also, just take the well done for a, a hot minute because the ones that are really, and I mean, setting the bar, still feel like they have not quite done enough yet, you know. Monkey's uh, not quite off the back, mm. not yet. But then, like, if you keep that trait, I learned with my coach, keeping that trait forever, you'll be unhappy even if you're a billionaire. Yeah. Like, you, nothing's ever enough. But is that, is that bad? And, I mean, you'll be happy, let's be honest. You'll be happy. But You always want more. Yeah, you'll still be driven and you'll still want, I don't want to get to a day, I mean, I've been yeah, really you comfortable. Couldn't, you couldn't even get to a day where you'd be like, yeah. let's not, let's stop. You know, one of the lines that changed my outlook on things when I was in my early 20s, I've always, for context, I've always been told that I've got lots of potential. Same. Oh, oh, mate, you've got so much potential. Yeah, same. <laughs> Every Not report really. card. And, yeah, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm going to kill it one day. <laughs> <laughs> I have got the potential. <laughs> <laughs> and I never actually applied myself. Yeah. Because I just kind of rested on my laurels of like oh i'm i'm generally somewhat more talented than most people i've got all this potential it'll all just happen one day. For, yeah it'll all just happen for me one day yes and then one guy sat down and um he sat down and he goes to me blake you know hard work beats talent all day yeah so unfortunately for you mate your talents are relevant because you're gonna have less talented people crushing you at every part of your life yep because they just work harder Yep. So until you work harder, you're never going to be more successful uh, than any of these people that are less talented than you. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit. Who said that? How old were you? I think I was maybe 22. I don't want to say who it is because I don't want to give him any credit. But <laughs> <laughs> I think I've worked it out. <laughs> yeah. And that was a moment where I was like, uh, I was actually looking around at, at like other recruiters, other people. And I'm like, I am technically, like I've always thought, I'm a better, like I'm a way better recruiter than you, but you technically are billing more than me. But I had this really weird disjointed internal value and external action that was not aligned. And so I was living in fantasy land thinking that I'm really good, but my results didn't show it until I started working hard. Yeah. Um, and then that's when everything, everything basically changed is when you get the grit, when you work hard, when you, when you kind of remove yourself from your, uh, your instant gratifications of, oh, stuff and I'm just going to go out with the boys or I'm yeah. going to go do this or I'll stay up late and then you don't apply yourself. But once you can finally make that make that transition, life gets a lot life, life gets a lot better. So what made you shift? And that's something that we see with some of the partners and obviously with people that have managed before, that they absolutely have the potential, the capabilities there, they know what to do and they'll put the hard work in for a good month and then maybe not for two. You'll probably know who I'm talking about. How do you, what what... What flips for you to go, okay, cool, I'm going to start putting in double the effort and consistently and stay there? Um, what, what changed? I was in a lot of debt. I think the first time my actual, my actual work ethic and application in life changed was when I started at Rock. I was selling photocopiers for a year and a half com only. I had like three credit cards out of personal loan because I've was partying and I literally took out a personal loan to go party for the weekend. Uh, crazy <laughs> dumb, crazy, uh, 20 grand unsecured personal loan. Was it a hell of a weekend? <laughs> it was a big weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I was just like rolling credit cards because you know when you um, yep. get a credit card and it's like, oh, 0% interest for 12 months if you roll the balance onto yep. the next one. Well, I did that three times, but I never got rid of the original one. <laughs> so I just had three maxed out credit cards. And, um, and then I started at uh, my first agency and that was the time where I fully applied myself and I'm like all right I'm just going to try and get out of debt in this next 12 months yeah um and uh really really applied myself and I started getting the wins um but that was I, I kind of had this realization that I was getting in my own way like my own limiting beliefs were stopping me um like I had one one conversation with my boss and I'd work like 7.30 to 6 and I'd be pumping the phones all day and then I'd, just, I'd turn up to work the next day ready to start working again. He's like, are you prepared? I'm like, well, no, I've been working all day yesterday. How am I prepared? And he's like, you've got to get prepared at night. Yeah. And I used to sit there and think, you 
fucking want me to finish at six and then spend another few hours preparing my data to call the next day? Like, what is this shit? Yeah. And then I just sat there and I thought, why don't I just do it? Why don't I just get out of my own way, prepare, make sure the next day is ready to rock and roll. And then that's when I finally, I I felt like there was a moment where I broke through my own limiting beliefs of you're meant to be working seven to five. And like, where's like, should you be working after that? You've put in a, f- a full day's work and then you just come to work the next day. And it was very, very um, simple, men- a very simple mentality. And until I broke through that of every day is the same, Saturdays, Sundays, Mondays, every hour is the same and you just got to get it all done. Yeah. And then that's kind of when things really shifted for me significantly. Yeah. So as long as you're not thinking, oh, it's a Saturday, I'm not doing anything. It's a Sunday, I'm not doing anything. Oh, it's six o'clock, it's time to stop working. It's all the same shit. Yeah. You just get as much done as you can whenever the time is to get it done. Yeah. That's what shifted for me. Good yeah. question. Yeah. That was a bit of a rant. Mate, what about you, what about you Dan? I think, yeah, car sales or recruitment would have been the first job I've ever took serious. Mm. Yeah. Like in my apprenticeship, I'd be working on an ambulance fitting out an ambulance and I'll just be sleeping under the ambulance having a nap because <laughs> they're low, <laughs> low floors. You can just hide in there and I used to get abused all the time and I got signed off my apprenticeship because I used to get the potential thing too. My yeah. teacher's like, mate, you're going to be welding dustpans for the le- rest of your life. You're nowhere. But you've got great potential but you probably just <laughs> won't ever achieve it. Yeah. And then um, I got told I was the worst appre- apprentice. There was 187 staff. I think we had 28 apprentices at the time. He goes, mate, I've been in this industry for 30 years and you're dead set. The worst apprentice <laughs> I have. I feel guilty to our industry signing you off as a tradesman. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That was my shit. parting message that I, that I got from him. And so you got um, signed off and got really inspired. I said, please, mate, I make you a promise. I'll never pick up a welder again. Just <laughs> let me go. And then I never did. And I walked out. And then I did b- buildings laborers for a bit. And then um, t- long story short, yeah, there's um, builder's labourer who's his grandson now goes to school with Archie and his dad and granddad who was working for, he said I was the worst labourer they've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. It wasn't for you. Clearly. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so picking up cement and... Don't you know, judge a fish on how to climb a tree, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it absolutely is. And you do. You had, well, you had the potential. You still have the potential, but you were in the wrong job. Yeah. 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 And then... Um, and school is not for everyone, let's be honest. No. No. Yeah. So, yeah, I just never never clicked. And then, um, yeah, the same with car sales. I guess like a bit of debt or a bit of a shitty situation after our little juice attempt at a juice business. Had a 30 grand juice that I had to pay off. So I was like, I need to sell some cars and get yeah. this, get back square. And then um, recruitment, it was, yeah, I think um, when I met Deanna, she's like, this is not a normal workplace. Like you guys are working Saturdays, Sundays, but it was just so much fun. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It was like the best. You have to be having fun yeah. with what you're doing or you're just never going to be driven to do anything more. You have to, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, I don't know what the point is. Mm. Yeah, recruitment was the funnest job Yeah, yeah, I've had. Still is the funnest job. Yeah. 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 This so is pretty fun. Too. This is, yeah, this yeah. is really fun. Yeah, is really fun. So talk to me about your experience as a billing manager because I often throw a little bit of heat at billing managers and yeah. say that they've got the worst job in the world. You're a billing manager, mate. <laughs> huh? With Vendita, you were a billing manager. Yeah, it was the worst job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking from experience, mate. <laughs> Been there. Yeah. Because as a billing manager, you're incentivized on your own billings, but your direction is to grow a team and there's a misalignment between direction and personal incentive that just never can get squared up properly. So how did you did you ever overcome that? Is it something you just learned to love or how did you... How did you battle with being a billing manager and growing a team but not getting incentivized unless it was your personal billings? Um, I think I was really, really lucky with Alex because he, I was a billing manager for a very short period and then I went into a non-billing manager and then I moved recently back into a billing manager role again. So I did some maths really quickly and realized that I was going to earn better on my team being more successful than me being more successful takes a bit of modeling. You look a little bit more long-term and you go, hold on, that's probably the better area for me to focus on. So I never became a, in, in Australia, 500K billing manager because, yeah, 
I realised that I was incentivized to do the opposite. And I think the conversations that I'd have with Alex all the time is, if we're setting up an incentive structure or commission structure or bonus scheme, what behaviour are you incentivizing? Mm. Because I think where most people go wrong and what I've seen across other industries is that if you're incentivizing your manager on their own billings more than growing the team, that's where they're going to focus. 100%. So where do you want their focus? But then it needs Why to be Why do they always do that? Though. Not many people set it up the way Randstad do. No. Yeah, and they were always changing it, which was really good. So they could change it, you know, as the market was changing and keep evolving, which was fantastic. But a lot of places just, just wouldn't. And I think that there's a degree of, well, how much can you pay a manager who's not bringing in as much income mm. while you're paying you know, really good commissions or whatever it might be to the rest? You've got to have a degree of money that's going back into the business. Um, so maybe that's why. Mm. Yeah. How, do you, how do you cover your cost if you're not billing it's in recruitment? It, it's hard. There's actually no tangible way or short-term tangible way to go, I'm recovering my costs from yeah. this non-billing manager. They need to bill. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I would say four out of five billing managers I speak to don't actually enjoy the commission structure that they're on yeah. because they are getting incentivized for their own billings and they're getting they're not being able to bill much because they've got a team of two, team of three, team of four. Maybe they're handing out deals to get someone up and running and yeah. all this kind of stuff. And it, it creates <coughs> almost like a bit of a a disdain or a little bit of a frustration or a bit of a jaded chip on their shoulder to be like, man, I'm putting in all this work, but I'm actually getting nowhere yeah. financially. Um, so what was so what was the structure then when you're at Randstad to get incentivized on your team? So it was quarterly and I was able to, if the team had hit a percentage of the budget that was set, I would get a flat amount. So based on a 95%, 100% and 105%. So obviously I just went, well, 105% is where I want to be. That's the bonus structure I want. And if I can consistently do that over four quarters, I'm going to earn really well. And then knowing, that, especially with the contracting book, they're going to stay there and I'm just going to be able to grow it next year. And then that was great. That's how it started. Mm. Then we got into a growth structure, which I was then incentivized based on how much the business grew. I loved the fact that I was trying to grow the business a million dollars year on year. I knew what my bonus would be if I got it right. And I pushed every inch I could to get it right. And and you built this team and majority of them had, or everyone had no experience? No, no, no. We did. Like I brought Burnett over from South Africa. Okay. She was incredibly experienced. We had Ram who was from the UK, very experienced. Cho came from the Gov team. So she had about a year's experience doing really fast paced um, temps in government. Mm. She kept that pace, but shifted it to the professionals space, which is one of the w reasons she did as well as she well, does as well as she does. But a lot of them were trained from scratch. Yeah. B Burnett and I probably used to love doing that and getting them onboarded and um, teaching them how to do things the right way. And yeah. Was, was it, e well, I suppose you wouldn't have any comparison, mm -hmm. but was it easy to attract recruiters to your team? Like is Randstad put up a job ad and everyone goes, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. The internal agents would have, well, the internal recruiters would have had a look at that. I imagine. Oh, and they just go, hey, these are probably the best people for yeah, the interview. Yeah. I did have, by the time I left, I had people approaching me or the team to come and work for us. But when I got there, absolutely not, no. Interesting. And so, so what are the what are the proudest achievements that you've got at Randstad? Like, what are you really happy you you achieved? Um, we used to have a little wall next to our desk with our awards on there. So I must have been with the business. It must have been my first year, and or maybe my first full year. I won Manager of the Year, which I didn't know was an award. So when they called my name up for it, I was absolutely just shocked, and I went to Sri Lanka on a little trip. It was amazing. But not knowing that this award existed and then to actually win it was phenomenal. I absolutely loved that whole moment. Um, and then we won Office of the Year and then we backed that up with like Office of the Year two or three times. But by the time we I'd been there for four or five years, we had this little wall full of Consultants of the Year, Office of the Year, Office of the Quarter. Like we were just smashing the awards nonstop. And I think I love that build phase and that growth phase where – you just get to celebrate every little win. I think it's just so exciting. And yep. watching each person just grow, like having that little wall of trophies was gold. Epic. Yeah, really, really cool. Yeah, how good. It's nice being rewarded on these things. I think a lot of uh, a lot of agencies 
Oh, they they somewhat do it, you know, little awards here and there. I yep. know I tried to do it at Vendito, but I wasn't consistent. I think we had a, like a really old like Biller of the Month plaque thing, but just sitting there organizing someone's name to get printed and sending it up and putting it on the thing, it was just a bit of a mission. Yeah. Um, to be honest, so having having a, a structured, um recognition kind of program i guess is that yeah. what it would be or yeah so we had annual awards and quarterly awards that we would do and yeah consistency is key with everything yeah. um but people love it they just yeah flock to it it's something you can be proud of yeah to be recognized for that stuff absolutely yeah. what do you envision your one year being like at x recruiter like where, where we are now yeah in 12 months time i think the joy of x recruiter is that you don't know and I love that so much. And you're growing at such a pace that uh, I remember doing a course once called the LTDA, like Learning Transformation in the Digital Age, I think it is. So they said that whatever you would like to achieve in about three years, bring it right back to one because we're just going at such a pace nowadays that it's, you know, that three-year goal you could probably achieve in a year. And I can see here that you guys are growing at such a pace that you might have goals that are going to be, you know, four or five years' time. You're going to be doing them a lot quicker than you anticipate, and I'm sure you've already seen that. So I think in a year from now, you you couldn't paint the picture. Mm. Like even chatting to Emma about how's your role going and, you know, what do you think's next for you? It doesn't exist, which is beautiful because she can trailblaze that and create that as she goes. And everybody here has that opportunity to create their role. You even look at Serge's journey and where – he started and how much he's grown in a year. I bet if he looked back, he would not have said this is where he'd be in a year's time. So I wish I could tell you, but I actually just don't know because the world is your oyster and how you can actually just create it. Epic. No, I love that. What do you think? Me? Yeah. Where are we going to be in 12 months? I don't know. It's really hard to put a finger on it. Yeah. I think... It, where do you want to be? Where do I want to be? Um, I want to have... Uh, being able to impact at least a hundred recruiters to start their own agency. Yeah. I think that'd be really, really cool. Um, I want to be able to contribute to them more than just starting an agency though. I really want to make sure that at X Recruiter, we're contributing to leveling up their life, their perspective, their outlook, their presence, what they value. Um, and it's more than just, you know, setting up an agency for someone. It's really helping them take take them on a journey from like one socioeconomic level to the next, whether that be their mindset, whether that be financially, whether that be with their family. Um, that's what I would love to do. Where, that's where I'd love to be in 12 months. On a grand scale. Mm. Yeah. What about you, big dog? Um, <coughs> yeah, well, if we reflect on when we first started working together in April, six months ago, I think that was what? five of us, six of us, and we had maybe 15 billing partners. Six months ago? Well, that would have been the year before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what year it is. Yeah. yeah. We started working together year. last year or this year? Last year. <coughs> no, when we you only came went into the office. Uh, I went full-time in Exocruiter in February this oh year. My February, gosh. yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah. Declan went full-time in Exocruiter January this year. So we've actually not actually worked full-time oh, for and then a full we year. Yeah, we physically worked in the office together from April. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in six months. Yeah, this is what we've achieved in six months. Pretty wild. Because for, for, for the year before that, we were both part-time, extra crude, like our own agencies, yeah. trying to juggle both. Um, and then, yeah, this year we decided, no, nah, we've got to make sure this is our year to go hard. Yeah. <coughs> and, um, yeah, and we've obviously made a lot of um, changes in our lives to be able to achieve that. And I think we've managed Managed, yes, yeah, su survived. Battle right. survived. With the grey hairs. Yep. Everyone's saying how quick we've aged in the last two years. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah, it'll yeah. be worth it. <laughs> yep. But I, I th yeah, I reckon there's some more international opportunities. Like we just signed our first New Zealand partner who will kick off in January. Got a couple more meetings with New Zealand partners over there. And yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, I reckon Extra Crew will become a global business. Yeah, easily. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we like to ask a question mm. uh, at the end for our guests. Oh, that wasn't the earlier one? No. No, nah, okay. we already asked that question, oh, no. so I'm going to ask another one. this next question. Okay. okay. They wrote this really well. I've got to try and uh, dissect the, the handwriting a little bit, okay. so just bear with me for a moment while I try and figure this one out. <laughs> Whose handwriting is it? I think it's Serge's. Uh, <laughs> 
Come on, mate. Just Other than out. getting into a punch on, what's the craziest thing you've done in recruitment? Oh, in recruitment? Yeah. Craziest. Either, you know, maybe I can give you some, some color to this. Yeah. Um, maybe a crazy client meeting, crazy candidate feedback, crazy story a recruiter's given you that you've had to try and uh, deal with. We've had some crazies, that's for sure. Mm. There was, um, so we did have a contractor that we had placed at a very large ERP company and um, they, he had not started on site yet. But he'd signed the contract and the organization came back to us and said, and of course my my lovely colleague was on leave, the one that had made the deal, so I had to pick it up. Um, they came back to us and said that they couldn't have him starting, they'd lost funding for the project. Um, so they were giving us the two weeks notice before we started that you know, that they didn't need him anymore, which they could do anyway without the two weeks notice. So we had to give him a call and say, Listen, they don't need you on site anymore, so sorry, you know, we'll actively try to find you something else. And he was not going to have one bar of it. And um, he wanted us to pay him out the two weeks notice. <laughs> and my lovely esteemed colleague had made an error on the assignment agreement and added an extra zero on the hourly rate. So it was a hell of a lot of money that he was asking for for the two weeks. And that it was just, you know, that when everything just goes wrong at the same time. So now mm. you've got the, the wrong hourly rate. The two weeks notice that he's asking to be paid for, even though he hasn't been on site yet, and there's still two weeks before he's supposed to be on site. And he, yeah, I remember him really shouting at me on the phone and going absolutely bananas and then trying to sue us. Wow. Yeah. So you didn't pay him out his two weeks? No. That's crazy. So at what? Like 8,000 oh. an hour. No. 8,000 8, 8, an hour? Because well, it was usually 800. 8, oh, sorry, a day. it would have been 8,000 a day. Yeah. yeah wow. It was around there. Yeah. <laughs> so what did you do? 80 grand. Yeah. What was the outcome? Uh, oh, fantastic legal team. Wrap that up. It'd pretty be pretty quickly. hard to go head to head with Randstad's legal team. I imagine so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they were yeah. On, on the mark. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But no, yeah, that awesome. was probably the craziest thing I've had to deal with. I was just like, what is wrong with you? No. Epic. And having him screaming down the phone unnecessarily. Well, thank you, Taryn, for your late notice arrival on our podcast. We really appreciate you sitting down, sharing an hour of your time, your story, what you've been up to, and uh, yeah, having a good chat to me and Deck. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks, T. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another Confessions of a Recruiter podcast with Blake and Declan. We hope you enjoyed and got a lot of value and insights out of this episode. If you do have any questions or you would like to recommend someone to come on the Confessions podcast, we would love any introductions. And remember the rule of the podcast, like, share and recommend it to a friend. Until next time.